It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Salida. Professor Salida was born in West Virginia of Palestinian and Jordanian parents. He received his BA from Radford University in 1997 and his MA from the same institution in 1999. He completed his PhD at the University of Oklahoma. After earning his PhD, he was assistant professor of English at the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater, where he taught American and ethnic American literature until 2006. He then moved to Virginia Tech as associate professor of English, earning tenure three years later. Stephen Salida is author of six books, including Anti-Arab Racism in the USA, Where It Comes From and What It Means for Politics, which is the winner of the 2007 Gustavus Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights Outstanding Book Award. That's a mouthful. Uh, the other books are The Holy Land in Transit, Colonialism and the Quest for uh, Canaan, or Canaan as you pronounce it in English, <laughs> Modern Arab American Fiction, A Reader's Guide, and most recently, Israel's Dead Soul. In granting the award, the Gustavus Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights recognized his book as one that, quote, extends our understanding of the root causes of bigotry and the range of options we as humans have in constructing alternative ways to share power. <clears throat> Miriam Cook, who uh, is a professor of Middle East history at Duke University, described the book as, quote, a sobering analysis of anti-Arab racism from neoconservative to liberal rooted in America's settler colonial past and seeping into every corner of our lives. Stephen Salada takes the reader into the crisis of Arab American communities in the wake of September 11th. Written with passion, this lucid account of the dangers of American imperialism paints a dark picture of the agenda of the Bush administration, not only in the Arab world, but also for people of color at home." End quote. As most of you undoubtedly know, Professor Salida has been at the center of a controversy that strikes at the core of the doctrine of academic freedom and the uh, constitutional right to free speech in general. The basic facts are as follows. In October 2013, Professor Salida was formally offered a tenured position in the American Indian Studies program at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. His appointment was to begin in the fall 2014 semester. On August 1, 2014, just weeks before he was to start his new job and after he had resigned from Virginia Tech, Professor Salida received a letter from the Chancellor at Illinois, Phyllis Wise, saying that she would not be forwarding his appointment to the Board of Trustees, thus effectively rescinding the offer. The basis for this extraordinary action was a series of strongly worded tweets Professor Salida produced in response to Israel, uh, Israel's attack on Gaza that summer. <clears throat> on September 10th, 2014, the Illinois Board of Trustees upheld the decision to cancel the offer. The response in the academic community to this outrageous action by the Illinois Chancellor and Board of Trustees was widespread and overwhelmingly critical. The cancellation of the offer caused an uproar at the University of Illinois itself with 16 departments voting no confidence in the chancellor and trustees. <clears throat> I'm proud to say that the philosophy department was one of these, and I quote here from their resolution, which is similar to those from the other departments. <clears throat> so this is the philosophy department's uh, resolution of no confidence. Whereas the recent words and actions of Chancellor Philip Wise, President Robert Easter, and the Board of Trustees in connection with the revocation of an offer of employment to Dr. Stephen Salida betray a culpable disregard not only for academic freedom and free speech generally, but also for the principles of shared governance and established protocols for hiring, tenure, and promotion. The faculty of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign declares its lack of confidence in the leadership of the current chancellor, president, and board of trustees. Amen. <laughs> a large number of academics across the country, I and many of my UMass colleagues among them, also signed a statement. I think I just heard from uh, Professor Salida that it's up over 6,000 now, actually, that signed this. Signed <laughs> So what did they sign? They signed a statement refusing to present papers or take part in conferences in Illinois until the decision was reversed. 
Let me briefly give my own take on the controversial tweets. Discourse in mainstream circles in our country concerning the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and conflicts in the Middle East more generally is shrouded by a fog of lies, half-truths, and morally distorted perspective. The people of Gaza have been suffering under the tightest blockade in the world since 2007. They suffer daily attacks from the Israeli military and also have been the victims of three major assaults by Israel since 2008. <clears throat> the summer 2014 attacks killed 2,200 Palestinians, the vast majority civilians, and about 500 of whom were children. I could go on and on with the details of their suffering. The point is that were it not for this fog that blinds most Americans from the true nature of the conflict, they would be outraged by the carnage and by their own government's substantial contribution to it. One way to combat propaganda is to engage in calm and reasoned debate. That certainly has its place, and I like to think I do that myself when given the opportunity. But sometimes, to cut through the fog, we need a strong dose of not just light but heat in the form of expressions of pain, anger, and outrage befitting the crimes to which they are addressed. Bombing defenseless children isn't the sort of thing you ought to have to argue against. Opposing it is a matter of sheer decency. And angry condemnation is the appropriate response to vicious assaults on decency. Just think how screwed up is the perspective that generates more anger at Professor Salaitis' tweets than the Israeli assaults he was condemning. Mm -hmm. I have one other anecdote that I didn't write down that I just want to tell you because this is such a, a repeat of um, I was teaching at Boston University in 1982. During the summer of 1982, some of you may remember, was the horrendous Israeli assault on Lebanon. <clears throat> Killed tens of thousands of people, just caused you know, horrible, horrible um, effects there. So Eli Wiesel and others on the BU campus organized a protest. Were they protesting this atrocious behavior? No. What they were protesting was the use by some people who were protesting the Israeli assault of the term genocide and holocaust. Now, yeah, you can argue about whether that was appropriate, but that's what you protest? As tens of thousands of people are being killed? It seems to me this is the same, this is just another, another instance of that. Anyway. Lest it be thought that only someone with ethnic and familial ties to the victims could react in this way that Professor Salida reacted, I want to end with a recent quote from the famous Jewish actor Theodore Bikel that he published in an op-ed in the Jewish Journal last September. It's entitled, Grieving the Children of Palestine and the Dream of Zionism. <clears throat> so I quote from Theodore Bikel. The shameful apologies trying to justify the death of Arab children with trite explanations of collateral damage and use children as shields and they will die fill me with anger. Yes, a Jewish child's life is precious to me, but how dare anyone suggest that another child's life is less precious, less deserving of a future. What is most frustrating is that those who place lesser values on non-Jews are supposed stalwarts of a community that I can no longer rightfully call mine. Where is the commitment to open dialogue, the respect to hear out opposing ideas? Where is the dictum that commands us to listen, to debate, to agonize with each other, rather than hurl epithets of disloyalty? I give you Professor Salida speaking on civility, academic freedom, and indigenous peoples. Thank you. Well, before I, uh, before I get, get started, let me um, thank you for, for spending your evening with me. I hope that, that we'll have a, uh, a conversation and discussion that, that you find useful. I want to also thank the 
various co-sponsors and those who put so much work into um, into to organizing this event. Um, SJP, particularly, who, a, a group here and elsewhere that's doing such extraordinary work. And I, I want to, to single out also, although I, I shouldn't single folks out, um, Professor Naus and uh, uh, Professor <coughs> Rosenberg for just you know their 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 friendship and them and and you know all of the uh, inconvenience that, that that I've caused them over the past uh, few weeks and <laughs> Professor Levine's um, introduction, which is just uh, fantastic. I don't even know how I can uh, follow that one up, but uh, I'll, I'll 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 try anyway. What he's saying is very much of of a piece of some of the things that. <coughs> that I want to focus on. The first one is academic freedom. And I think maybe it's useful for us to develop a, a common, if crude, understanding of the concept. It's generally taken to be <clears throat> something that applies to tenured faculty but that's not what it's supposed to be. Students, graduate students, instructors, adjuncts, tenure track faculty all have, theoretically anyway, access to academic freedom. One of the reasons, or one of the primary reasons, <clears throat> that tenure even exists is not as, as a lot of uh, 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 angry right-wing commentators would have it to give lazy professors lifetime job security so they can do nothing and, and uh, feed off the public till, but to actually provide a mechanism by which academic freedom can be enforced or enacted. This tells us lots of things, but primarily tells us that in academic institutions, as in most other institutions, Administrators will seek to punish those who somehow challenge what the administrators say or the interests of that particular institution, or those who end up embroiled in a controversy, or those who articulate points of view that administrators or that their colleagues or the community members find in some way objectionable or offensive. We can see with regard to, to students and particularly to non-tenured instructors the ways in which academic freedom can be limited. So we've seen, an, uh, we've seen a, a serious uptick. Uptick is probably downplaying it. We, we've seen a serious rise in the use of adjunct instructors in, in universities, both public and private over the, the, the past 10, 15 years. And one of the reasons that, that their numbers continue to increase is not simply because administrators are, are always looking to, to cut costs. That certainly has a lot to do with it, but these faculty members <coughs> cannot access the protections of academic freedom in quite the same way that their tenured counterparts can. So you end up with a, a class of employee that is more or less expendable or that is functionally expendable. If they end up criticizing the administration, causing trouble, ending up embroiled in a public controversy, the department chair or the dean can simply choose to not renew the contract. And that's a, a, a technical iteration right, of, a, of an abrogation of, of academic freedom. And these sorts of things uh, happen often enough. There is no unified theory of academic freedom. There's certainly no unified practice. You know, ever since I got fired, I started thinking more and more about what academic freedom means. And I've been, I'm probably going to start wandering out so I don't end up leaning on the podium and, 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 and sleeping. Um, <laughs> Academic freedom, whatever else it is, however else it, it can be practiced, generally refers to a particular 
protection that enables faculty members and students and instructors and, and others to comment on issues of import in the world or in their local communities. This American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, which is kind of the, uh, the, the organization that, that uh, has, has helped create the major standards of academic freedom and has an interest in overseeing them today, calls this kind of, of expression an extramural utterance. But academic freedom also enables academics to research topics that, that uh, might end up producing controversial conclusions. It also allows them to engage in public debate. It allows them to criticize their own administrations without getting fired. In other words, the one thing that nearly everybody can agree on vis-a-vis -vis academic freedom is that it hypothetically allows us to in some way challenge a particular status quo. And without the ability to challenge a particular status quo, it becomes extremely difficult not only to do the work for which so many of us are trained, but it becomes extremely, exceedingly difficult for us to progress in our ideas, to challenge boundaries, right? to undermine various forms of intellectual restriction and authority. For, for all of those reasons, academic freedom becomes important and what we do here in the spaces of academe is essentially impossible without it. At the same time, academic freedom isn't a panacea. We should recognize its inherent limitations. One of its limitations, again, is that it generally or often requires tenure in order to be enforceable in the first place. And second of all, it does and has always done a better job of protecting certain forms of speech than others. When it comes to articulations that can be seen as outside the norms of a particular mainstream, but not particularly threatening to any centers of power, Academic freedom does a nice job of protecting such viewpoints. It hasn't done such a great job throughout the past hundred years of protecting work that systematically explores economic iniquity, structural racism, police violence, the banalities of patriotism, militarism, imperialism, and then of course criticism of Israel. And if you want to be even more pointed, and I think this distinction is important, criticism of Zionism. Right? If you look, and I've been, I've been looking at different cases to try to compare them to, to, to my own, and I, I've, been, I've encountered lots of, of interesting initial findings, I guess, if, if you will. I don't know that anybody has, has synthesized uh, this sort of these sort of data yet, but uh, I hope one day to be able to. Starting before the infamous McCarthyite purges, right, people who were considered to be somehow on the left or to have some affiliation with communism right, were, were being fired. People who were agitating around women's suffrage were fired. People who were agitating around African American civil rights or black radical organizing were fired. Then I, I would give an extended McCarthy period. There's kind of a pre McCarthy period. So you could say from 1940 to 1960, dozens of academics were fired based on, on suspicion of communist political leanings. And then during the era of the Vietnam War, academics were fired for their anti war organizing or anti-war speech in some form. One of the most famous of those who got fired for his opposition to the Vietnam War was Howard Zinn. And then at, at, um, at Yale University, the historian Stoughton Lind was um, fired for visiting North Korea on a, on a delegation of, of concerned scholars. And all of the academics on that delegation got in, in, in some form of trouble. Stoughton ended up getting fired. And, 
he ended up not being able to get a job in, in the aftermath of, of that firing. In fact, he tells me that he received five job offers at the department level, and in all five cases, it got up to the level of the board, the governing board, who all nixed his appointment. And so we can see a, a, a pretty firm sort of distinction between, uh, between what happens at, at, at a departmental level and, and what ha very often happens in administrative offices. The most outstanding example, the one most people are familiar with, I think, is that of Angela Davis, who in 1969, she was hired as an assistant professor of philosophy at UCLA. Ronald Reagan was the governor of California at the time, and in his bid to, uh, to absolutely ruin that system, um, he, he leaned on the, the UC Board of Regents to, uh, to, 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 to pressure Davis and, and to get her out of there. She was a member of the Communist Party. Right? She was also a member of the Black Panther Party. She was also a, a very vocal and active scholar around women's issues, around race issues. Um, you know, she, she had all kinds of problems from, from the point of view of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> she threatened him on multiple fronts. <laughs> so they, they, they fired her. Then Davis got criminalized, of course. She was falsely indicted for murder. She beat the rap because the rap was nonsense in the first place, got reinstated to her position at UCLA, and then she got fired again. And the UC regents cited Davis's inflammatory language as the reason for firing her. So I think often about Davis's case not only because we, we sort of exist in the same, same broad disciplinary spectrum. So uh, the, the kind of work that, that, that I do uh, so, sort of uh, interacts with, 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 with hers at certain points, but also that phrase, inflammatory language. And all of this happened to Davis even before I was born, but it, it nevertheless makes me wistful for a time in history when upper administrators were more honest about what they were seeking to suppress. <laughs> I see inflammatory language as, a, as, as as horrible, but somehow, rhetorically anyway, an improvement over civility. But civility is a type of term that, 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 that's pious and precious, and that we're supposed to automatically accept who, who after all, is against being civil. Right. It's a type of term that, that you can put forward to mark somebody as undesirable without actually having to explain why you've done that, what the rationale is, what the point is, what the purpose is. You just toss out the word and, and, and sit back and let that common sense or common wisdom run its course. Unfortunately for the University of Illinois, uh, people did know the term <laughs> civility and it turns out uh, very few of them were willing to, to sit back and, and accept it as an unarticulated standard of professional conduct. Right? And in fact, the University of Illinois has explicitly had to walk back its use of, of the term civility, but the damage was done. There's a reason that after Phyllis Wise released that letter citing incivility, uh, as, as a rationale for her decision back in August of last year, that other university administrations picked up the term and ran with it. Right. And they're still running with it. People are starting to, certain campuses are starting to require faculty or employees to sign civility statements. Right? Which, if, if it's functionally different from a loyalty oath, then I'm not quite certain how. Right. Right? Right. Its function is the same. There are other differences, but, but that's its function. Um, and civility has an interesting set of connotations in, in this regard when we stop and think about it. First of all, compared to inflammatory language, and by the way, it's, it's sort of connected to inflammatory language by the term collegiality, right, which, which, which precedes civility, right? You can, civility becomes our responsibility. It's something that we pursue. It's something that we take on, something that, that to which we must aspire. 
right? We have to, we have to, uh, we have to pursue servility. We have to practice civility. Uh, inflammatory language exists in a grammatical inverse. Nobody aspires to inflammatory language. Right? It's kind of a default. Right? It's, 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 it's a particular identification and interpretation of a speech act. But civility is so much more. Civility has all kinds of insidious underpinnings right? that, that don't often get articulated overtly. Well, what, so what does it mean? People are talking about how we don't like it as, as a particular standard of evaluation because, of it, because it's ambiguous. Right? And that, that's a very good reason to, to oppose its usage. But there are other reasons to oppose its usage also. One is because I was hired in the American Indian Studies program, and in the context of American Indian people, or indigenous people more broadly, or even more broadly than that, colonized people, a term like civility connotes in deeply troublesome and violent ways. It's a term that comes out of colonial discourse. It's a way of organizing the world and its inhabitants into distinctive taxonomies that, that existed alongside sometimes have propelled acts of colonization and foreign settlement. In fact, nowhere did colonization take place without an attendant notion of a civilized society versus an uncivilized society. And very few acts of colonial violence were not justified by the invocation of the victim as somehow being less human than the perpetrator of the violence. Think about American Sniper. Think about it. Right? I, I didn't watch the movie. I never watch any movies. But I read the book. I read the book. I read the book before, I, before it became a thing. I was in an office somewhere, and I saw it, and I started flipping through it. And, and I honestly can't remember what office I was in, and I've been like trying, it's like shit, I want to make sure never I have to go there ever again, because uh, <laughs> but just, uh, that book sitting around scares me. But I, 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 remember, I remember just reading it and in, in, in encountering Chris Kyle calling the Iraqi savages. Right? Well, that's the discourse of civility. It still exists in, 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 in imperial practice. It still exists in ongoing forms of colonization. It still exists in, in, in barbaric uses of police violence, right? It still exists. Now, are the administrators aware of the connotations of, of, of civility, particularly vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples? But probably not. I, mean, I can't imagine that their conversation went something like, hey, we're getting ready to do something kind of shitty and unpopular to this guy. You know, what word should we use to justify it? Oh, hey, let's, let's use the word that, that, that uh, evokes memories of, of horrible colonial violence. You know, I, I don't think I'm thinking about that. Um, uh, I, I think the conversation went something like this, and this is my own uh, paraphrasing, right? Uh, because if you cut through the, the, the sort of bureaucratic speak, you know, you, you can get to your own paraphrasing in more useful ways. It went something like this. We're upper administrators. We have to speak to a broad general public. We need to find something as banal as possible because bureaucrats love banality. Right? That's the, the, their lingua franca. Right? They don't know how to communicate otherwise. And so, oh, civility. That's about as, as, as banal a, a, a term as you can find that also happens to, to pack a particular punch and put forward a, a set of tacit demands. Right? So, that's how the conversation went, but think about it. That's precisely what makes the invocation of civility so troublesome, the fact that they weren't aware of its connotations. That's how colonial logic gets reproduced. That's how it survives. That's how it recreates itself. The same thing is true of racism, right? That's how racism continues to exist in particular institutional structures. So it's easy to, to wag our finger at 
the, you know, that fraternity at the University of Oklahoma, or a Paula Dean, or a Donald Sterling, and all of these other people who say horrible things and then get busted for it, but that also enables people to sit back from a position of ostensible non-racism, right, and, and sort of exclude themselves from the kind of, of, of discourse that they find distasteful, right? When a more useful way to approach racism is to think about the way that it constantly gets reproduced in our everyday language, in the everyday logic that goes into governing an institution, such as a university, or the corporate workplace, or whatever the case may be, the way that it's built into our economy, the way that it is, is built into arenas of popular culture, the ways in which so many of us benefit from it, sometimes unknowingly, right? That's where you locate racism. That's where you locate colonial discourses. You don't locate it where it's overt or obvious, right? You locate it precisely in the places where it presents itself to you as normal or normative. And the University of Illinois, by using civility in the way they did, provided that opportunity. And then, the second thing, with the second major problem that, that I'm finding with civility is it's, just, it's utter hypocrisy. I mean, think about it. I mean, even if we accept civility using its banal implications, right? Uh, you know, as a synonym for manners or etiquette or decorum or whatever, right? Uh, and we shouldn't, because even those terms are implicated in colonial histories, by the way, right? And they, and they too uh, uh, have, have histories of racialization. But even if we do, even if we go by, you know, the standard of, you know, just don't be an asshole. Uh, and, uh, and, then I don't, I don't see if, if that kind of standard were consistently enforced, you know, over the next 75 years, like, you know, maybe, tops, right? It's like, it, it just, it kills me when, when like, after, after the decision came down, you know, there was like a coterie of, of, of professors who were deeply, deeply invested in Israel, right? They just don't want to admit that, that they're happy I got fired because they don't like my politics. But we all know how it works. Zionists know how it works, anti-Zionists know how it works, everything else is window dressing. We know. You know, I'm not stupid, right? I know, we, we, we both know how this works. Anything else is, is just pretend. And it's consummately dishonest, but, you know, they would sit down and, and sanctimoniously go on, well, you know, about civility being the bedrock and the foundation of, of our enterprise. It's like, what? Don't lie. Do you know what I mean? Like, have you never been to a department meeting? <laughs> have you ever been to a department meeting? Have you, have you ever seen, you know, are you completely unaware of, of the, the horrible institutional forms of sexual harassment that go on among faculty? Or, you know, are you just going to lie about the fact that we submit papers for blind peer review and sometimes get awful reports back because they're anonymous? That some, in some cases, even, you know, I, I could boil them down to die in a fire. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're, you're Terrible, how dare you waste my time, leave academia and never come back. You know, kinds of reports, right? Uh, so there's, there's actually never been anything civil about this academic enterprise in the first place. I know that's hyperbole, right? But it's certainly not been as, as, as civil as su uh, professorial supporters of the University of Illinois make it sound. Right? And then there's the locations of civility. Harry Nelson, who, who was the former head of the AAUP, he, he, he really deserves all the hisses he gets. Um, he, 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 he did, I think, um, a, a, a really nasty thing to me and a real disservice to, uh, you know, to all people in, in, in academia by uh, becoming the university's primary cheerleader, particularly given that, that he's made his career on, on sort of being the doyen of, of, of academic freedom. But, you know, Kerry Nelson was quoted in, in November as, as, you know, during the public talk as calling Judith Butler a lunatic. Um, what the hell is civil about that? The man wrote, a, the man published a civility manifesto before he called a queer feminist woman philosopher a lunatic. In public, right? In her absence. And unless you believe that it was just a, a, a rhetorical colloquialism, he prefaced it by saying, I would never say this in print, but I think Judith Butler is. Right? So that was not accidental, right? 
So I, I would never call somebody a lunatic. I've never called somebody a lunatic. I've never acted in, in, in such a way. But these things happen all the time. They never get called out as uncivil because the positionality of the speaker and then, of course, the positionality of the subject. <laughs> of course, you can call Judith Butler a lunatic. Judith Butler supports BDS. Uh, Judith Butler uh, is, is positioned on, on the left. But it, the, the examples go on and on. It's my belief that charges of civility have much more to do with the location of the critique than with how the critique is presented. We've seen hundreds of, of instances of uncivil discourse, discourse way worse than mine, right? Uh, being seen and passed on without a second glance. It tends to be the criticism of Israel that gets specially focused on as, as forms of incivility. And I truly believe that, that the location of my comments has much more to do with the university's decision than with the way that I presented those comments. For one reason, I've used the same language, or the same sort of language, to discuss a host of, of, of geopolitical affairs. You know, I have tweets saying F ISIS, and I've, I've criticized the Jordanian government in, in, in really harsh terms. I've criticized the PA and Hamas both in harsh terms. I've criticized the Queen of England in harsh terms. <laughs> I think snarky would be better than harsh. Uh, you know, that, but you know, in all of the, the tweets that I've seen that, 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 that purport to prove that I'm uncivil, right, it's only those that, that focus on, on, on Israel right, that, that I see. None that are focused on, on the way that, that I make, made fun of Republicans, right, or the way that I've made fun of, of, of Arab states. Right? It's always Israel, every single time. It's the location. But think about also what civility tacitly asks us. Characterize depending on the locations of our critique and how folks in centers of power right, uh, respond or react to those critiques. I have been called ever since August, you know, kind of angry, or my, my tweets have been called angry, but I hear a lot about, you know, oh, he's an angry person, or he's an angry this, and it, I, I'll confess that it bothers me, because um, I actually don't consider myself to be an angry person. You know, I'm not, I've always been kind of civil to a fault in, in, in academic spaces. That's why you haven't seen and believe me, there's a small army of people looking for them, right? So I haven't seen any of my former colleagues come out and say, yeah, he was a dick, I hated working with him, <laughs> right? Or he yelled at me once, or, you know, he called me name X, Y, or Z. That, that have, you haven't had students coming out and saying, this is my viewpoint, or he gave me an F for, you know, for, for not being an anti-Semite. You know what I mean? Like, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, they, because that, that, I, I don't know, I'm just not an angry person. I wake up smiling, I, I usually go to sleep smiling. Uh, <laughs> it depends on when I just turned off uh, the TV. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm not angry. Um, you know, I, I, I very, very rarely lose my patience, very rarely. Um, I, I tend to make exceptions for justifications of, of racism and, and colonization, but uh, otherwise I'm, I'm pretty even good. And I'm saying this not, not to be, um, self-serving or, or conceited, but, but I, I, I guess I'm sharing with you my process of thinking through how this stuff works and how, how these extremely non-neutral terms that pretend to be neutral, right, sort of inform um, important political spaces. So I started thinking more about the trope of the angry black woman, right? And then now, of course, there's the trope of the angry Arab, right? There's, you know, there's even a, a block on it. Uh, and he's like, he's totally angry. But he's angry. He's role playing anger. Right? He's role playing anger. I'm sure sometimes that his anger is, is, is sincere, right? But it's, 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 it's a rhetorical trick. It's a rhetorical paradigm, right? It, it's, 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 it's a way of sort of enacting and, and simultaneously challenging a, a, a particular perception. But um, angry 
is almost exclusively applied to people of color in its various iterations, right? You never, you never hear, and it, which is funny, because like if you turn on the radio, you will hear like 16 really, really angry white dudes screaming about something or other, right? <laughs> you know, you just will. You know, uh, but uh, angry is, is, is almost exclusively, not fully, but almost exclusively the domain of, of, of ethnic minorities, right? Uh, sometimes women, uh, sometimes queer, sometimes transgender, you know, but, but definitely it, it, it's the domain of, of what you might call uh, non-normative bodies and non-normative ideas. And there's a reason for that. And so I wanted to build a little bit on Professor Levine's, Professor Levine's comments that, that I would say that, yes, my tweets during Gaza were angry. Sure, some of them were angry. Some of them weren't, right? Some of them were, were, were very calm, and some of them were very basic appeals to humanism. But some of them were indeed angry. And if you look at the, the six of them that have been isolated and decontextualized, you might think that the whole Twitter feed is angry, but it's not. But the ones that are angry are, it doesn't begin and end with the anger that is evident in the speech act, that things underlie that anger. Right? That sometimes a statement that appears only as an articulation of anger is in fact an expression of love or an expression of empathy. A way of saying that I'm identifying with the victims of brutal acts of violence here. And I'm upset that other people aren't or that other people are actively supporting these brutal acts of violence or in some cases blaming the victims of the brutal violence for their own suffering which was going on in, in, in you know, all the time uh, um, during Operation Protective Edge. And so we were seeing images of children being killed by the dozen. We were witnessing evidence of war crimes. We were seeing massive destruction of property. We were seeing a population that had already suffered tremendously, suffered in almost unspeakable proportions. And I wonder what, if not anger, are we supposed to feel in that moment? Are we supposed to feel deadened, neutral? It seems to me that anger is the most humane and human reaction to the witness of this sort of violence. It, it indicates a sort of identification with the people who are suffering. It's a way of saying, I recognize them as equally human to me. And in that recognition, I am upset that they're being treated this way. And if you don't feel anger when you witness these terrible acts of human barbarity and the suffering it produces, then there might be a chance that you are unable to fully identify on the level of human with the victim. Not in all cases, but in many cases. What are we supposed to feel other than anger when we see yet another video of a police officer shooting or choking to death an innocent young black person? What other than anger? Are we supposed to feel happy when the cop sticks his knee in the side of somebody's head and says, fuck your breath, as the person is dying? What, what you know, are we supposed to feel neutral? Some people feel aroused by that kind of violence. Some people shrug their shoulders and say whatever. Some people automatically take the side of the police officer. And we call those people racists because they're unable to see the humanity in the picture. You see the humanity in the 
victim, you recognize that the, 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 the victim is human in precisely the same way that you're human, despite potential race differences or class differences or economic differences or whatever, right? Then your first emotion is anger. <coughs> it can lead to all kinds of, of, of different articulations, right? But the emotion itself is there. That's why every minority is, 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 who raises a voice, an impassioned voice, is called angry. Because we have so much injustice to respond to, that we constantly recognize, that we constantly see being systematically ignored. So I see the, um, the violence in, 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 in Gaza. And my son at the time, is, is, he, was, he was two and a half, he was two years old. And, you know, and I, I, I don't know that, that it's, uh, it's a good idea to share this with a, a group of strangers because I know it makes me sound a little bit weird, but it's true, and, and I suspect that at least a, a few others of you, at least, are, are weird in, in the same way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, because uh, we, we can find community in, in our weirdness. Um, I just, I kept seeing his face on the, the pictures of, of those toddlers who, and the infants who, who were being killed. I, just, I couldn't help it. I tried not to. I did everything I could. I tried to stifle, but I, could. I just kept literally picturing his face. And it's because, not only because I, sh I share a cultural and ethnic background with the people of, of, of Gaza, certainly that, that, that has a lot to do with it. It has a lot to do with the fact that I know a lot of people in, in Gaza. My best friend is from, from Gaza. I've visited Gaza a few times. You know, I'm, I'm at least rudimentarily familiar with, with, uh, with the landscape. But more than that, because I've never internalized the mythologies that tell me that Palestinians hate their children, or that Palestinians sacrifice their children, or that Palestinians don't love their children in quite the same way that we love our children. If you take away these mythologies, these racist mythologies, and you recognize the basic reality that even if you're not of Palestinian or Arab or Muslim or Jewish background, right? you can recognize that these parents love their children right, in precisely the same way that I love my children, that they are forced now to grieve in a way that I can't even begin to imagine, that their lives have just been permanently altered in ways that I can't even wrap my mind around. Right? that I know, even though I've never felt it, I know what they're feeling right now. And it's something that I'm scared to death to ever have to feel in the first place. If you make these basic connections, right, then there's no other option but a type of empathy that leads to an impassioned response that leads to what might be viewed as anger, anguish. It's a kind of reaching out to other people. And it's also, remember this about Twitter. Everything exists in a rhetorical context. So when I say something like, if you're defending Israel right now, you're an awful human being, and the University of Illinois says, oh my god, he would call his students awful human beings, it's like, no. I've just listened to 100 to 200 people justify the murder of these children by saying, you know, they deserved it, their parents did it, who cares, they're future terrorists anyway. In that light, that's about the most damn civil response that I can even imagine, right. right? Palestinians, given all the nonsense they have to hear, right, about Israel's colonization, the, the constant whining that we have to hear that our very existence makes people feel unsafe, right? The constant attacks on us by university administrators, by politicians, by legislative bodies, given the remarkable degree of racism 
that exists against Palestinians in so much of America's public discourse, we are remarkably civil in response to these realities. Remarkably civil. And we have every reason to be quote unquote angry in response to it. Because nobody these days, or very few people these days, are defending Israel's actions. Because Israel's actions are becoming increasingly impossible to defend. People are now defending the idea of Israel. They're defending Israel on an existential level. Think about the ASA boycott resolution. Professor Rosenberg and I worked on that together with a bunch of other awesome people, and uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that out loud. Anyway, uh, okay, so, uh, um, anyway, uh, totally not on civil, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, and, and we, I remember, for those of us who were at ASA, you probably remember that during the debates about the resolution, nobody who was anti-resolution, nobody who was anti-BDS was saying that, oh, well, everything they're accusing Israel of is false. You know, Israeli universities aren't complicit in the military occupation. You know, uh, there, there's, there's no military occupation. These were arguments you heard all the time, five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, right? And, and, and before that. No, instead they were saying, well, is it the role of a scholarly organization to be political? Right? Which is just a way of saying we want to be political in a way that suits us. You know, uh, you know, or or what about what about Chinese universities, or what about North Korean universities? So, we, but you didn't hear anybody actually defending Israel's actions. You did during Protective Edge. You 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 didn't hear people defending Israel's actions, right? People were again. Nobody was saying no, 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 no. Israel hasn't killed 500 children. Israel hasn't killed 2,000 people. Israel's not bombing schools or hospitals or UN shelters. No, no, Israel's not doing any of those things. That was simply not part of the Hasbro narrative. What you heard was people defending Israel, and this doesn't constitute an actual defense, by the way, by saying it's the Palestinians' fault. Hamas did it. Right? They just don't love their children like we do. Or they're putting their children you know, uh, on the roofs of their houses. I remember when Naftali Bennett the Israeli uh, Minister of Finance, uh, he's a real character. Uh, he was on Wolf Blitzer's show uh, once. And this is right after those four teenagers got bombed and, and, and were killed while they were playing soccer on the beach. And, and, and th for that alone, for that alone, Netanyahu and the Israeli military brass should be sitting in a cage in handcuffs in front of the International Criminal Court and not giving rogue speeches to the U.S. Congress. That alone. <laughs> and there's not a bit of anger in my voice, nothing but a cool form of basic moral logic. But after that, so Wolf Blitzer asked Bennett about it, and of course Bennett didn't address it. He goes on this, uh, this uh, unsolicited diatribe about how Arabs have missile launcher rooms in their homes. <laughs> he did. He used the phrase missile launcher room. All right? And then he went on to explain that he knows because he saw them in Lebanon when he was you know, part of the invasion there, when he was in the army. This is the same guy who said, I've killed lots of Arabs in my life, life and there's nothing wrong with that. All right, so we're not dealing, but we're dealing with a mainstream politician. We're not dealing with somebody on the margins. This is the point, right? And Wolf Blitzer, like even Wolf Blitzer, right, was like, huh? You know, his face was like, do you, do you remember? You youngsters probably don't remember, but but those my age uh, probably remember. Uh, you remember when uh, when Kanye West uh, said uh, George Bush does not care about black people? Do you remember Mike Myers' face? That's what Wolf Blitzer looked like. He was just like, you know, you know. It's, moment where, you know, it's like, wow, you even alienated the wolf. So, they're, 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 this is the level of discourse, I'm telling you. They're talking about missile launcher rooms. They're talking about Palestinians purposefully sacrificing babies. You know, they're, they're, this is the level of discourse. You can call it all kinds of things, but you cannot call it a defense of Israel's behavior. Right? So, what do you do when you can't win a debate? Israeli supporters cannot win a debate anymore. They, they never really could. But they can't now, based on facts, they can't based on any, any normal form of moral reasoning, they can't based on 
journalistic reports, human rights reports, scholarship, which by this point has, has absolutely conclusively proven what happened from the years of 1947 to 1949, you cannot win the argument. You cannot say Israel is not a colonial power. You just can't. You can't say Israel wants peace. You just elected Netanyahu, who said there will never be peace. Right? You, you, you cannot make this argument anymore. You can't win this argument. All right? What do you do? What do you do? You don't have the argument in the first place. You shut it down. And that's what they've been doing. Right? That's what they did with me. That's what they did with Bruce Shipman, the Episcopalian chaplain at Yale who got fired. That's what they did to Brant Rosen, a rabbi who had to leave his congregation because he criticized Protective Edge. There is an entire industry now devoted. It sounds conspiratorial. I promise you it's true. An entire industry now devoted to getting academics critical of Israel fired. Somebody even wrote a piece in the Jerusalem Post a few months ago that was stunning. I must have looked like Wolf Blitzer slash Mike Myers when I first read it. Basically saying, we have a BDS problem, right, and we need to do something about it. This is my own paraphrase. We, we also have an academic freedom problem. We can't get professors fired just for, just for you know, supporting BDS. So what do we do? Oh, academics tend to have publications. We can go through their footnotes one by one and find anything that we can conceptualize as plagiarism, and that way we can get them fired for academic misconduct. These are the kind of conversations that, 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 that people are having. We can talk about how odious those, those strategies are, blah, 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 but in the end, it's because the debate is over. It's done. What they have left now in support of Israel is repression. Right? And silencing voices that they find inconvenient and turning to sites of state authority in order to enact these practices of silencing. State legislatures, the courts, the police, uh, university administrators, so forth and so on. I've been talking for so long. Let me, um, let me just, just finish up by saying that uh, Amid, amid, the, um, amid the destruction of Gaza, I remember in particular the scenes that, that they were coming through social media and some news sites for a few days of, of, of ice cream freezers, the kind that open like this, I guess we call them deep freezes here, and they had stored inside of them um, wrapped in white sheets, the, the, the bodies of dead Palestinian children. Some of them were quite young, some of them seemed to be about four or five, and they were stacked on top of one another. And they were stacked on top of one another, first of all, of course, because they had just been murdered by the IDF, but second of all, because the morgues in Gaza had run out of space. And third of all, because there was no electricity. Gaza had one functional power plant, and Israel bombed it. I guess they put Palestinian babies in it, I don't know. Uh, and in the heat of Gaza summer, there was concern about rapid decomposition and, 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 and you know, uh, matters of, 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 of health, and what, what had already been uh, a completely uh, uh, destabilized social structure. And parents would come and look for their missing children in these freezers. And just the symbolism of it is, 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 seems almost as, as, as horrible as the reality itself. It's a terrible juxtaposition of innocence and reality. Right? And those freezers probably provided the children some of their happiest moments when they were still alive. Uh, my contention is, and I will always contend that if you don't have a profoundly intense response to that sort of imagery, right, then you are utterly incapable of seeing those children right, as fully human.
in the same way that you might see your own children or the children in the filial group with whom you identify. And I think about those children, I wish I didn't, I do, <laughs> um, but I think, about, I think about them when I hear about another young black man who's just been murdered by the police. I think about the children when I read another story about missing and murdered indigenous women, up in the thousands now. I think about those children in that freezer when I read stories or see stories about children of undocumented workers who are warehoused in tiny rooms, cycling with heat, wall to wall, without windows. If we are tasked now with responding to this kind of injustice, and so many other kinds of injustice, with dispassion, with civility, then we abrogate one of the most important, if not the most important features of the work that we do, which is to contribute to a type of world that is left much better than the one into which we were born. That should be an impetus for our work. And that impetus is impossible to pursue if now we are going to be judged by an ambiguous and tendentious notion of civility. Thank you very much. Did he get another job? 
And, you know, she nonchalantly responds 16 years later. You know, and everybody in the room kind of looked at one another and just started cracking up, you know? And, and so, you know, this, that's a thing about uh, the, you know, a lot of the cultures in, 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 in this profession. Once you get the stink of controversy attached to you, you know, you, you develop a certain type of uh, toxicity, you know, and then and, and people just don't want to, uh, to deal with it. And then upper administrators are, are very often profoundly averse to, um, you know, to, to any sort of controversy or bad press. Um, so I don't know that I'm going to get the chance. Um, it, it seems like a, a very, uh, very unlikely at this moment, but if I do get the chance, then, then, then I, I, I would love to go back to the classroom. Thank you so much for the question. It was a fantastic speech. Uh, two questions, uh, I guess three questions. Um, what's next? Um, in, in your campaign, your, your, your fight against uh, uh, you know, the, the chancellor and, and you know uh, for reinstatement. Uh, what can people here do today to stand in solidarity uh, and advance that campaign? Uh, and is there a place for people if they want to uh, to contribute money to help defray dif travel costs and stuff? Uh, because you know, obviously, I think lots of people need to hear what we said today. I feel like I kind of already answered the the, the what's next. Um, <laughs> This, this moment reminds me of, of when I was a grad student, particularly my last two years, when everything seemed possible and nothing seemed possible simultaneously. You know, you, just, you, know, you, you can imagine yourself uh, getting like this really great job in this really great location, uh, but you could more easily imagine yourself uh, starving to death, you know, uh, you know so, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like that. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what's next, we'll see. Um, in terms of uh, expressing solidarity, I think, um, like I, I appreciate the sentiment and the question so much. It's, it's hard to answer uh, without sounding uh, completely self-serving and or uh, narcissistic, but I really do think the best way to, to express solidarity is, is just to continue the type of work that we do locally and then in broader context. And what I mean is this, this, this happened to me in the same way that it's happened to hundreds of, of, of other people, right? And, and they, they get, uh, they deal with problems that come out of the, 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 the same uh, centers of, of administrative and, and political power. So those, those movements to maintain Democratic governance on campus, you know, those movements to make sure that, that governing boards and donors aren't overreaching into the academic and the academic side of the university and playing a direct role in hiring and firing and in curricula and, and all those sorts of things. The, uh, the, uh, sort of the, the formal or formalized suppression of, of critique that focuses on structural forms of, of inequality, you know, whether it has to do with race or gender or class or whatever. Um, I think working on those issues is a way of helping me directly, but also sort of helping all of us, right? So sort of putting uh, our work in the, the context of this space that, that, that all of us share. Um, this has been uh, a bad situation for, for me in, in in, in a lot of ways, but it's also been a really, really bad situation for grad students who are, are doing work that, that, that uh, could be seen as controversial or who are going up on the job market soon. It's been extremely bad for my colleagues in American Indian Studies at the University of Illinois and in American Indian and Indigenous Studies more broadly. They've uh, borne the brunt of, of a certain sort of racist narrative that, that developed in its aftermath. Right. The idea that they can't handle their own affairs without the oversight of more sage and responsible superiors. Right. So it's an allegory of federal Indian policy, except it's not actually allegorical. Right. Uh, you know, so it's been really, really difficult for them. So we think about the context of, of you know, uh, you know, indigenous studies, African American studies, ethnic studies, women, gender, sexuality studies. These sorts of fields. Within the structures of the modern corporate university, we see just how tenuous their, their positions are. So I think any sort of, of, of work 
right, within a campus environment right, around this constellation of issues is deeply important, not only vis-a-vis -vis my case, but I think vis-a-vis -vis the, the type of, of academy that, that we want to get had, right, or the, that we want to create, one that's more democratic, one that, that, uh, that actually confronts systematic racism, one that, that values work, right, that doesn't just dully recapitulate platitudinous political nonsense, right, uh, and, 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 and so I think that's the way to, um, that's the way to help. Um, that's the way to, to help. It's, 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 it's a collective project. It's a collective issue. I've said before that I believe that the University of Illinois gave us a gift. They gave us a gift through their brazen, I want to use civil words here, uh, through their brazen overreach, through their What's a euphemism for sheer incompetence? Uh, <laughs> sheer incompetence. Uh, through, you know, like, every time interest in my case dies down, it's like, okay, I just need the university to release a statement. Then the university makes a comment, and everybody's just like, oh my gosh, damn it. Yeah. You know, uh, and so they, they've given us a gift in the sense that we've already, so many people have been organizing against these, these issues, but, but now they, 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 they were almost, uh, they were almost, almost nonchalant about doing it this time. I think that's what raised everybody's hackles. They're just like, yeah, I don't like these guys sweet, we're gonna fire them. You know, and, and, and so they almost took it to a different level. Right? This, these things used to be more insidious. Right? It, it used to be uh, done more behind closed doors. Now they're just sort of upfront about it and saying, this is what we're gonna do. And remember that, that over 200 college and university presidents signed or produced letters against the ASA boycott resolution, all of them explicitly on the grounds of academic freedom, zero of them have condemned the University of Illinois for this violation of academic freedom. So that's, that's what's at stake in other words, Sarah. So we're organized on, on, on this side around making sure what the university's done doesn't become a precedent, but they have their own form of principle, if you can call it that, right? Uh, around those fancy oak tables and those nice offices, right? That have private restrooms and uh, you know like refrigerators and, and you know and assistants and uh, you know they um, they they're 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 very deeply invested in the university being able to get away with it and like, so that that's how you can help right uh, that's how you can help that's a really really long answer I'm sorry hi uh, it's a really uh, it's a true honor to have you here uh, my question is you talked a little bit about the coloniality of the concept concept of civility. But I was wondering if you could talk about the coloniality of the concept of safe space. Uh, when I was an undergrad, uh, involved in different kinds of queer student organizations, did a lot of organizing around uh, creating safe spaces. And then I think 10 years later, we were all really surprised when those exact same discourses of safe space uh, were used uh, to condemn advocates for justice in Palestine. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about the way in which safe space is actually a good colonial concept? So, sure. Thank you. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, that is a loaded question in a very good way. It's a really important question. And I should confess up front that I've, I've, I've been considering these things, but I haven't worked out exactly where, where I come down on, on the matter. So let me maybe give kind of a, a, a few meta observations, if you will. One, that there is no, there's no movement or vocabulary that comes out of the left that's not eventually going to be appropriated in some way by the right. You know, so that that's just yeah. So the way that safe space is sort of origin, right, and it's 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 sort of current usage, right, is is I think a function of a particular pattern that, that tends to happen. But second of all, you you mentioned the coloniality of the notion of, of safe space, and that strikes me as as extremely important. If we can find a way to put forward a definition of safe and safety that 
wasn't implicated explicitly or implicitly in disparate conditions of power, then I would be all for the idea. Right? Given that it's impossible and that notions of safe and safety, hell, even of space, right, are, are embroiled in, in, um, in all kinds of known and unknown social and political structures, it's very useful to think closely about hell, even to anatomize right, uh, these, these notions of, of safe space and think very closely about what we're actually trying to accomplish and who is included right, in, 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 you know, in, in this project, uh, who's executed either on purpose or not, and how the discourse is being used outside of your own immediate organizing community. So now we've seen the safe space being used by administrators to punish faculty, right? Uh, or even to punish other students, I guess, in, in, in some cases. So the, the rhetoric of, of student safety and student comfort you know, is, is, is now sort of firmly in the vocabulary of bureaucrats right, who are using it as a, as, as a way to uh, rationalize the restriction on, 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 on sets of, of, of discourses, curricula, or political commitments, or, or whatever. So, but again, going back to coloniality, I've never been, I've never been hugely swayed by the notion of a safe space, even in its uh, conceptual incarnation because it often, not always, often forecloses recognition of geographies in the world in which it's impossible to escape violence, where the safe space doesn't even exist. And even places here within uh, the, 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 the United States where, where notions of, of, of safety can be a little bit too optimistic, as if there's a place in this national ether that can be free of racism or, or sexual violence or you know these sorts of things. I don't I don't know that the uh, or a space free of colonization, right? Uh, I don't I don't know that, that it's quite possible to to imagine, much less create that kind of space when the ground on which we stand is is already colonized and in which uh, racism and other forms of, of, of violence continue to, um, to predominate. So yeah, I, I, have a, I think uh, I'm, I'm a little bit down on the notion of, of, of safe spaces. You know, I think attaching them to, uh, to certain modes of, 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 of coloniality is, 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 is uh, it, it's a useful exercise. Thank you for being here. So um, I guess I'm kind of thinking out loud here and trying to formulate a question as I go, but you were able through your case to trace the fact that the pressure was coming from people who make really big financial contributions to the university and that the pressure they were able to put on um, the chancellor to actually insert themselves into the hiring process. It makes me think here at UMass when there was a plan put out in, in having um, students who are Iranian nationals being accepted to the university, right? How are we going to trace the fact that the university tells us one thing as to why they're putting a ban, but it's probably what's happening is that we can trace the fact that there are big financial contributors who are putting pressure for this to put, you know, for this to go through. In fact, the university sort of had to um, take a few steps back on their statement because it was a lie; it wasn't true. They've softened up on their language, and there's still going to be discrimination based on students who are Iranian nationals. And so, I guess it has me. The question I'm trying to formulate is. 
how is your case and the implications of being able to having a judge rule in favor that you can sue individual donors help us on this campus be able to trace the source of where the discrimination is happening and the pressure is happening and put pressure on our administration that the policies that they're moving forward to ban Iran Iranian nationals are racist, discriminatory, and that we have to build a campaign on this campus against it and challenge our own administration. Thank you both. Um, here, here at UMass, simultaneously with the campus <coughs> initiative to um, formulate a strategic plan around diversity, and I've heard of a similar program at Illinois called um, Inclusive Illinois <laughs> that uses the Twitter hashtag, many voices. And so uh, I have a very similar question to the previous one, but just like pointing out that these, how are these, these things are going on simultaneously. Okay. We're hammering people. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I've never done. I'm going to be terse. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a groundbreaking moment now. Um, the, the influence of, 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 of donors, you know, it tends to get people riled up as well it should, but we have to, to, to think about it closely. You know, it's, it's not just a, um, it's not just a, a, an individual moral failing on the part of, of the donor or the person who accepts donor money and, and, and then makes herself or himself subservient to donor interests. It's a, it's a, it's a systemic problem, right? It's a, it's a problem of, of how the U.S. political system is structured in general, and it's a problem of how universities are becoming increasingly privatized and thus reliant on, on private contributions and private contributions come with strings attached. And if you embolden donors to attach more strings, they are gonna take you up on that and attach more strings. I don't know, um, I don't know much about the, uh, you know, the case of the uh, Iranian nationals, so I look forward to hearing more about it uh, later, but I would not, because uh, you, you talked about the, you asked me about the case and, and, and the implications of the judge ruling, I would caution anybody against investing their notion of victory or defeat on what happens in the courtroom. I, I very much caution against that. And I think we're going to win, by the way. I think we have a very strong case, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's, some of them seem very open and shut, but you never know what's going to happen in a court. You never know. It involves judges, it involves juries, it involves attorneys, just it involves all kinds of things. It involves uh, <coughs> legal precedents that, that none of us have ever heard of unless we're lawyers, right? Uh, probably haven't heard of anyway. But most important at all, it, it involves institutions of the state, and it's just not a good idea to see those institutions as repositories of justice. You know, we, 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 should, we, we need to keep working to create our own outcomes. Um, and then I, I think that, that kind of have, have addressed the, uh, the, the second question, but... <sighs> Diversity as a term and a practice, if you trace its, its, uh, its origins, doesn't come out of universities in the first place. It's, uh, it comes out of uh, human resources practice, departments and, and, and corporations. <coughs> and so we talk always about the corporatization of, of campuses, and it's very easy to recognize certain vocabularies that a lot of managers have pilfered from the corporate world, right? Best practices. Uh, but one of the early pilferings of corporate vocabulary is diversity. And the, the very purpose of diversity within this particular structure is to represent so many people that it doesn't really represent anybody at all. Right? And Virginia Tech, we have like a principles of, of community, and it listed who, who, who's among them. And honestly, once, okay. I did this, I really did this. Uh, this tells you how sad and boring my life was at the time. Uh, I tried to think of a, a, a human being, right, based on different categories of identification, who would not fit somehow underneath the, 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 the definition of, of diversity, and I put I, I put I was like, no, you know, can't, you know, you, you, no matter what kind of um, human you can imagine, it doesn't fit. So diversity is, is not just a diversion. Right? Not only does it have a corporate origin, but in many ways it works actively against the identification of systemic forms of racism on campus. 
right? It stops it from happening. It, it employs a, an entire sort of vocabulary of inclusiveness and tolerance that simply don't lend themselves to a type of rigorous analysis of how matters of, of race and class and, and gender and these sorts of things play out in the actual spaces of, of academe. You show me a, a, you know, so probably somebody can, so I, I shouldn't speak in such absolutes, but I, I would guess that there's very, very, very few instances of an institutional diversity department, whatever they, they call it, or an institutional practice of diversity that has supported a strike, a TA strike, or that has supported a living wage, or that, right, has, has you know, they, they just don't do these things, right? That, so it's, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I would put my hope in, in diversity in, in precisely the same way that I would put my hope in the legal system. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could just comment on a, on a paradox. On, on the one hand, I think I agree with you when you say you know, Israel has lost the argument, so they re resorted to these things. Um, just before one of the Gaza wars, you know, one of the uh, people who worked with the National Information Directorate said, in the war of pictures we lose. Uh, and in many ways, I think you're right. At the same time, I wonder if you would comment on this. There was an article by Glenn Greenwald today. I'm not sure if you saw it. Uh, but he, re he referenced a very interesting, he talked about public opinion. Okay. Uh, and this was, um, this, this was a question that was asked was by the Bloomberg group. Um, okay. And so the question was, when it comes to relations between the US and Israel, which of the following do you agree with more? So that was the question, okay. and then two statements were given. Okay. The first statement was, Israel is an ally, but we should pursue America's interests when we disagree with them. Okay. The second one said, Israel is an important ally, the only democracy in the region, and we should support it even if our interests diverge. Those are the two statements. Okay. 45% agreed with that second statement that said Israel's interests should predominate when the two clash. Could you just comment on, so on the one hand, the, the argument seems to be lost at the same time. Public opinion never seems to be as supportive of Israel um, as, it, as it is now. Okay. Yes, sir. And let's take that. You know, those that defended protective edge uh, a lot of the time, they have seen that Israel is a problem and they, you know, place the blame solely on the Hamas. So, you know, a lot of times in the summer, I felt like that's what the that's the narrative that the media pushed. So you know, when we're tabling, a lot of people talk to us and ask, kind of like you know, they're not sure. Like, doesn't Hamas use human shields? You know, so um, is there any way to educate people? You know, to the extent which Hamas is used as a red herring, and it's Israel that's the problem. Sure. Yeah, I'll start with the uh, I'll start with the first question, and then I'll go to yours. Um, there, no, I do think that there's a, um, a, a paradox. Maybe in some cases it's not even a paradox. It has to do with the locations of, of support that, that Israel receives. The, that poll, I think its, it's findings are, are, are troublesome, but there have, been, uh, there have been other polls, but they were conducted at, during Protective Edge that showed that uh, people who identify as Democrats were identifying more with Palestinians than, than, than um, with Israelis. So it seems to have been some movement on the, the liberal left and using the highly scientific uh, uh, platform of Twitter. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where truth exists, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I am shocked by how many people these days with uh, sort of unite new identities and sort of Obama paraphernalia all over the place, uh, like retweet and engage with my very sharp criticisms <laughs> of, of Israel. And it did, didn't seem to me that that happened two or three years ago. So public opinion is, is, is definitely still in the thrall of Israel in the US. And there are a lot of reasons from that that really even go beyond Interest. I think a lot of the work that points to the settler colonial origins of, of the U.S., right, as, as they kind of reflect the settler colonial origins of Zionism and a comparable set of discourses, 
have show us over and over again that a lot of Americans identify with Israel on a spiritual level, almost at a, almost at what might be considered a visceral level. In other words, the story of Israel uh, is very familiar to them. Uh, it's one with which they identify deeply, and one that 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 happens to exist on a, a, a geography that is of utmost import to a, a significant population of evangelical Christians right, who identify with, with Israel based on uh, theological or scriptural factors. To me, the, um, to me, people who are not sort of attached to, um, to Israel based on, on uh, themes of Armageddon you know, uh, I, I think that, that, that with, with, with time in the U.S., they're going to more and more identify with the Palestinians or be more willing and, and, and able or even eager to criticize Israel. I, I worry more about uh, the way that Israel is still deeply ensconced in centers of power, in administrative offices, among politicians, in, in corporate cultures, and, and you know, we see this distinction over and over again, that it becomes so easy to, I guess, view these situations, or, you know, I don't know what I'm saying. We see over and over again how a movement Right, a, a popular movement or a grassroots movement that, that's pro-Palestine, either directly or tangentially related to something else, sort of gets stifled by a very small, right, but but powerful concentration of of of, of supporters of, of of Israel. And I don't know exactly how we, um, you know, how we how we, we we sort of ameliorate that that particular problem. But on public opinion, I'm 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 a little bit more optimistic, which I think segues nicely into the second question about education. Well, first of all, one of the problems that we have, again, it's not just that the, the, the mythologies of Israel are deeply familiar to, to Americans. It's not that they all identify with it. I'm just saying it's familiar to them, right? Uh, unless you, you kind of sort of critically examine those narratives or mythologies, it's easy to get sucked in. But there's also a set of mythologies around Palestinians that they view Palestine's national movement as, as an Islamist one. They see Palestinians in the same light that they would view Boko Haram or ISIS or Al-Qaeda or whatever the case may be. Right? And so they're constantly trying to position Palestinians into these paradigms that would be actually the dialogical opposite right, of, of positioning Jewishness as a normative feature of Zionism. They sort of uh, look at Palestinianness, right, as a normative feature of Islamism, you know. And so part of the, and that's one of the reasons you always hear about Hamas. But also you hear about Hamas because that's what so many Zionist commentators attempt to reduce Palestinians to, and the Palestinian national movement to. There's no sense of a vibrant history. There's no sense of a vibrant polyglot culture or a people. There's no sense of, of multi-confessional communities in Palestinian society. Nothing, right? And also, no sense that, that we have very strong evidence by this point that Israel had a role in the creation of Hamas in the first place. And second of all, that Israeli colonization began around 100 years before Hamas even existed. So as a form of education, it's, it, it's extremely important to put the, the so-called conflict in the context of settler colonization rather than in the context of religious acrimony, right? Or like this, this timeless, this timeless, uh, yeah, this timeless ethnic acrimony. And how many times you've heard about it? They've been fighting for thousands of years. <laughs> no, we, we really haven't. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, it's just, uh, who, who are they, anyhow, right? The, you know, the Arabs and then the European Jews? I don't think that they, <laughs> they really encountered each other until the late 19th century. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I just don't get it. And, and so, you know, we, we, 
we have to, to, to view the, 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 the so-called conflict in that class because people always say, well, what about the tunnels and what about Hamas? But I don't give a shit about Hamas, right? Hamas does all kinds of, uh, it has all kinds of policies that I think are horrible, right, and that I disagree with. But I'm not living in the Gaza Strip. I'm not under constant attack. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not being put on a diet by Israel. I'm not having my lawn mowed by Israel, right? I, you know, that's for them to decide. That's who they elected, you know, that's their decision. It's not mine. But in terms of an, an actual moral paradigm, when you compare the type of violence that, that Hamas produces against Israel versus the type of violence that Israel produces against Gaza Strip, then, then we're in different universes here. It's not even an argument. It's ridiculous. And second of all, what, why does Gaza Strip even exist in the first place? It exists because of colonization. Those people are refugees. Right? The vast majority of them, unless the ones who have ancestry near or, or long time ago in Gaza City, right? You know, they're refugees or descendants of, of refugees. And they're living in, in an outdoor prison that, 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 that occupies a tiny geographical area. You can't just ignore that. Oh, you know, you know like so tunnels and human shields and, and this and that. It's like, well, you know, you're, you're making it sound and you're implying that there's an equivalence of power here. Right. But there's one uh, nation called the Gaza Strip governed by Hamas that is uh, roughly equal power to this other country called Israel. You know what I mean? And they're just kind of at war with one another. Settler colonization, creation of refugees, the fact that people in Gaza cannot travel, they're in trap. The fact that we cannot understand an act of violence based on its most obvious iteration, like launching a, 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 a missile into Israel, that is a very limited understanding of violence that the very existence of the Gaza Strip in the condition in which it exists is an act of continuous violence on the part of Israel. <laughs> <laughs>